All right, well, good morning again. It is good to... Hey, there. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. <laughs> um, it is, uh, again, it's good to be, good to be back <clears throat> as we're continuing our series, uh, Summer of Grace. We're in week three. And before I um, kind of, ju- uh, before I jump in, I want to say, uh, one, it was so awesome having Larry Dower here with us last week. Um, covering while my family and I, we were down in Florida, uh, visiting family, visiting uh, friends, visiting Disney. Um, we took the, took the kids to Disney, which was great. Um, no, it was great. It was great. Um, actually, you know, some of them had more fun than the others. Um, we'll show, we got a picture right here. Um, we'll show, this was uh, at our character breakfast that we went to, if we can get that picture up. If we can get that picture up, the screen. There's a, our son Judah was having the time of his life with Mickey Mouse, absolutely loved it. Riley, on the other hand, um, if we can go to the picture of Riley. There you go. She was uh, not as <laughs> excited um, to see some of the characters, but she did have fun. Like with pretty much everything else. It was just the, uh, just, just the character she wasn't a big fan of. <laughs> um, but it, no, but, but for real, it was great to be away, great to be with friends, great to be with family, but it's great to be back. Um, great to be back. So again, Larry Dower was here last week, um, you know, covering Philippians chapter 2. Um, I'm sure he did an amazing job because it's Larry. He always does an amazing job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I do want to say this. Um, the message today, a bit of a change of change of plans, <laughs> a bit of a change of plans. So while I was, you know, originally this whole idea for the summer series is we're going through the book of Philippians. So week one, we did Philippians one, Larry did Philippians two last week, and now I was going to do Philippians three um, today. But while I was down there in Florida, I was just doing my own personal quiet time with the Lord, and I've been in, I've been in the book of James, and as I'm reading this passage... <clears throat> I just really felt the Lord like just very clearly telling me like, nope, this, this is it. This is what I want you to spend some time on. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks, we listen. And so um, instead of Philippians 3, we're going to be in James today. Um, but what I do want to do is um, I did have some thoughts on, on Philippians 3 that I wanted to share with you guys. So um, what we'll do instead is make sure that you have filled out a connection card and we have your like email, your name and email address and stuff. In our database, because what I'll do is later this week, I'll kind of just send out a video um, to our Duchess database there. It'll be just like a 10, 15-minute video, just kind of going over um, some of the key points that I wanted to highlight there. So you can have that to watch on your own or not watch or whatever you want, whatever you want to do. So um, again, so yes, so we're going to be in the book of James today, James chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, you want to open up to James chapter 1. Um, or, you know, the verses, they'll be up on the screen, or if there's Bibles in the seat back in front of you. So if you don't own a Bible, you can take that one. That is our gift to you. Um, You can take that, and you can um, bring that home with you. So, um, again, Larry was here last week, and if you don't know Larry, um, what you should know about Larry is he's a man of of many, many hats, right? So he's an elder here at the church, Um, he's also, he's a husband, he's a father, he's a grandfather, he's a nuclear physicist. So I imagine that hat is like much bigger than the other ones to cover his gigantic brain that, that, that he has. Um, but him and his son, Zach, they are also incredible woodworkers, right? Woodworker is honestly probably a little offensive to them. They're more like wood Picassos, right? They are just geniuses at like looking at a piece of wood and turning it into something beautiful. Um, our families are pretty close. Uh, Zach has built like a lot of furniture at our house. Zach, he also works for the church. And so he did a lot of work here at this building as we were remodeling it. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> they're just really great with all that stuff. And I asked Zach one time, I said, hey, what is, because I was just curious, because I know nothing about whatever the opposite of a wood Picasso is, that's what I am, right? So I asked him one time, I was like, hey, what is like the tool that you probably um, use the most or, or that you find that's like the most important one that you have? And almost without missing a beat, he said it was the tape measure. Because 
that's what tells him, you know, hey, how, how, do, how do I need to cut this piece of wood? What shape does it need to be in? What adjustments do I have to make? You know, and if he's only just a, just a little bit off, like a couple centimeters off, right? The whole project can be ruined. You got to start from scratch. You got to spend a lot of time trying to fix what you messed up, all that kind of stuff. So a tape measure. And <clears throat> when he said that, um, I thought that was pretty insightful, obviously for woodworking, but also for our own spiritual lives, right? Because I was thinking about how, just like how Zach and Larry can take a piece of wood and shape it into the image that he has for it, as followers of Jesus, God is continually shaping us and forming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And the process for that, is the, the, the term is called sanctification, right? But it's, it's progressive sanctification, right? Because it's not just a one-time, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a continual journey, right? Where every day God is making us look less like ourselves and more like Jesus than we did the day before. And just like the woodworker has the tape measure as a key tool for shaping the wood, God has a tool that is critically important um, for shaping us, and that is Scripture. See, we are called to grow and to mature in our faith, and the primary tool that God uses to help us with that alongside the Holy Spirit is Scripture. So what does this all have to do with James, right? What does that have to do with the book of James? Well, James um, is a letter, right? And it's written by, spoiler alert, James, um, who is the half-brother of Jesus, right? He's the half-brother of Jesus, <clears throat> and he's writing this letter, right, to Christians that were spread around outside of Palestine, right? And the theme of this letter is maturity, right? And so he's writing this letter, and he's writing to them because he's receiving reports that a lot of these people are facing problems in their personal lives and in their churches, right? So they're facing persecution, they're facing temptations to sin. There's church members that are competing with each other for power. They're showing favoritism to the rich. It's just a, a, a huge laundry list of issues that these Christians at the time were facing. And a major problem facing them was that they were failing to live out what they professed to believe. And many of these issues, unfortunately, um, they're not issues that died in the at the end of the first century, right? A lot of these are still issues that we face and that we deal with today, and that we face in churches today. And all these issues, they all had a common cause, and it was spiritual immaturity. There were people who called themselves Christians, right? That had heard the word, they'd studied the word. Some of them even went and started churches, right? But when James takes a look at them, he doesn't see Jesus. He sees a lack of maturity. So James writes this letter to address this issue. And uh, that's what we're going to focus on today. But first, let me just pray for a moment. Father, we love you. And God, I pray now that as we take these next few moments looking into your word, um, that you would just work mightily in this place today. God, that you would speak through me, that any word that comes out of my mouth that is not of you would just fall on deaf ears. In Jesus' name, amen. So James chapter 1, starting in verse 19, starting in verse 19, this is what it says. Know this, my beloved brothers, <clears throat> let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls." But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. 
So there was a lot there, and we're going to kind of take this sec, this, we're going to take this portion of Scripture section by section. Um, but I actually want to start um, quickly in verse 21. In verse 21, we are called to um, receive with meekness the implanted word. The implanted words. James is kind of painting this picture, right, where the word is literally planted in our hearts, right, and we are called to receive it with meekness, with humility. <clears throat> and, and just as a plant grows and produces fruit, the word takes root in our hearts and produces fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. <clears throat> um, However, uh, the word, right, it needs to be planted in soil that is ready to receive it, right? And Jesus talked about this in the parable of the sower, right? So Matthew 13, uh, verses 3 through 9, uh, Jesus did a lot of his teaching through parables, right? Which are just, they were, they were stories. They were stories that Jesus would tell that would drive home a particular, you know, spiritual, biblical, like, lesson and truth that Jesus was trying to get across, and so here we have Matthew 13, with the parable of the sower. It goes like this. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So in this parable, Jesus is essentially describing four kinds of hearts. Four kinds of hearts. The first is the hard heart, right? This is where the seeds are kind of just thrown along the path. Right? So this is the hard heart, the heart that wasn't able to receive the word at all. Right? And so they don't take root. They don't do anything. They just, they just fall along on the path. The second heart is the shallow heart. This is the heart that receives the word initially, right? but there's no, there's no depth. And so the seed is unable to take root, and it's unable to bear fruit. Then third is the unrepentant heart. This is the, this is the you know, where the seeds, they're spread among the thorns and the weeds and the thorns choked out the seeds. This is the heart that is aware of sin. This is the heart that is aware of sin, but allows it, even affirms it, right? Where the word comes in, but a lack of repentance prevents it from being able to take root and to bear fruit. And then lastly, there's the fruitful heart, the one that we should all aspire to, right? The fruitful heart that receives the word, allows it to take root, and then it produces proper source of fruit. So how can we make sure that our hearts are proper soil ready to produce fruit? Well, this is where we go back to James because James kind of points out, <clears throat> James points out and shows us how. So the first is to receive the word. Receive the word. James says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. Quick to hear. Whenever I hear that phrase, quick to hear, it reminds me of when you know, uh, Judah is our, our, first, our firstborn son, right? So when we, go, when we go to the hospital, when Danielle is you know, giving birth, Right, like you've got the doctors and the nurses and the in-laws and the blogs and all the kind of like giving you all this advice and all this. Okay, this is what you have to do and you got to do this and you got to do that and blah 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 blah. And then you go home and everyone leaves and it's like, okay, now now what? You know, it's like, wait, like this kid just like stays here for the next eighteen years? <laughs> like this is, I got to figure this out. Like okay, and so. You know, the first couple, those first couple nights, you know, he's sleeping in the little bassinet, like, by our bed. And I remember every time that kid would make a... He was a great kid. He was, like, we were very blessed. At, like, he was a great sleeper and all that kind of stuff. But 
every time he would make a peep, you know, if he would like, you know, randomly cry or whatever, we would like shoot up out of bed and we're like, oh my God, is he okay? Like, is he hungry? Is he cold? Is he hot? Is he sick? Can he breathe? Is he choking? You know, like all these things of like, oh my gosh, oh no, we have to do something. And then, you know, that goes away after the first kid, you know, as parents, you, you know, that, that kind of goes away. Um, but still, but then even on times where he was not doing those things and he was just like totally quiet and calm and content, we would still find ourselves sometimes like laying in bed and just like waiting to hear the peep so that we could hop up and take action and get him what he needs, right? And so when, I, when James says, be quick to hear, like that's the picture that I have in my mind of like, we are sitting there ready for the word. <laughs> like we are ready for the word. We're ready to hear what God has to say so that we can jump up and we can take action on it, right, right away. And that should be our attitude in our spiritual life. And that should be our attitude even when we, when we, uh, when we come to church, you know, that like, hey, I want to get to church because it's an opportunity for me to hear God's word preached. I'm eager to hear what he has for me today. That should be our attitude when we're reading our Bible like on our own at home or, you know, with our spouse or in a small group or whatever. Like, hey, we are attentive. We are quick to hear what it is that God is saying to us. So James tells us to be quick to hear. He also says to be slow to speak, slow to speak. My mom used to say all the time growing up, some of, you, some of your parents probably said this to you and maybe some of you say this to your kids, you know, too. But my mom used to say all the time, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason so that you listen twice as much as you speak, all right? Actually, like, <clears throat> again, so we should be quick to hear God's word, but we need to actually listen to it. We need to actually obey it, obey it. Someone who is growing in spiritual maturity listens to the word because they want to be transformed by it. They want to be transformed by it. The spiritually immature person listens to the word so that they can argue with it. They could try to twist it to fit their own personal opinions or biases or whatever, right? That's what the spiritual immature person does, which leads us to the next point, slow to anger. So quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know what happens when we are faithful about being in the word and developing our relationship with God? What happens then is that he reveals sin in our lives that we need to repent of, things that we need to acknowledge as sin and move in the opposite direction of. And our response to that, our response to that should be one of gratitude of like, Lord, thank you for showing this to me. So it should be gratitude and then it also should be repentance. It should be repentance. But James is warning us that the spiritually immature person does not do that. The spiritually immature person doesn't get angry at their sin. They get angry at God. You know, they'll say, the spiritually immature person will say things like, you know, God, if you were, if God was really loving, then like none of this stuff would really matter to him. Like I could kind of just do what I want. I could live however I want. I'm not hurting anybody. I can just do my own thing, <clears throat> right? Um, that's the attitude. That's the mindset of a spiritually immature person person. James refers to the word as a mirror, right? A mirror, what's the job of a mirror? It's to show you what you really look like. You know, when I was getting ready this morning, right, I looked in the mirror, and guys, I have an honest mirror. My mirror does not pull any punches. It tells me straight up, right? And so if I'm looking in the mirror, and I see that like, hey, my, my mustache is out of whack and I've got gunk in my eye and stuff hanging out of my nose. Like imagine if I look in the mirror and I see all that and instead of taking the time to correct those things and look presentable, um, I, instead I just get angry and I break my mirror. You know, like that sounds ridiculous of like, oh, come on. But like, that's the truth. That's the truth. That, <clears throat> um, that is how some of us react to the Bible when it begins to show us who we really are. We don't want to do the work. We don't want to have the tough conversations, right? So instead, we just, we just get angry. We get angry and we just walk away. And again, I'm saying we because I'm right there with you. I've been there. I've been, it's not, it is not fun <laughs> to have um, the stuff 
in your life like revealed to you and pointed out and some of the wrong and then having to like, again, have hard conversations, make tough decisions, decisions, all those things. That's not fun. It's not enjoyable, right? So I have been there. I've been there. <clears throat> it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay not okay when we've been confronted with the truth. James continues, says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. James sees the human heart as a garden, right? Where if it's left on its own, it's only going to produce weeds and thorns, which is why he's urging us to rip up the weeds in our own hearts and prepare the soil. So how do we prepare the soil? Well, it starts... It starts with confession. It starts with confession. And if you come from a, a Catholic background, um, I understand that word confession could mean something totally different. Um, that's not the type of confession that we're talking about. I'm not talking about you, like, you know, coming and going to a, to a priest and then go say your Hail Marys and all that kind of stuff. Like, no, I'm talking about, it's not just me. What Scripture is talking about is a one-on-one -on -one personal confession between you and the Father, between you and the Lord, between you and the Lord. That's where it starts with. And when we do that, something beautiful happens. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a beautiful, beautiful promise. Right I'm going to read it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we repent of our sins before the Lord, when we confess our sins because of the Lord, he cleanses us. And the weeds and the thorns get ripped out. And because of that, we're able to receive the word with meekness, with humility. When we receive it with humility, we accept it and we submit to it. Right? We don't try to twist it to conform to our own way of thinking, right? but instead we receive it and it begins to take root. But James is clear on something else as well. Right? He makes a big deal about it. Hearing and receiving the word are a big deal. They're very important. But there is a danger in just hearing the word and not doing anything about it. James continues when he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James is quite blunt here. He's quite blunt here, right? Hearing the word isn't enough. Hearing it is not enough. We have to actually do it. We have to actually do it. <clears throat> my, uh, one of my professors in college, he said all the time, he said, your walk talks and your talk talks but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, you know, heard that at like 18, 19 years old, and it's stuck with me ever since, because it's so true. Our walk talks <laughs> to the people around us. Our talk talks to the people around us, but our walk talks louder than our talk talks. <clears throat> um, sermons, listening to sermon, coming to church and listening to a sermon, great thing that's good for your spiritual growth. Bible studies, small groups, all those types of things, these are great things. But if we're doing these things and it's not actually leading to obedience, it's not actually leading to, to, to obedience, then we're lying to ourselves. We're lying to ourselves and telling ourselves that we're growing when we're really not. Again, the word, it's like a mirror. You know, it's like, it's all messed up. You go, you, you're, it's before work, you're getting ready for work, you look in the mirror, hair's all messed up, got dirt on your face, all that kind of stuff. And instead of just taking the few moments to like do the work to clean yourself up, 
go, eh, I'm fine. And then you just get, leave and go anyway, right? Like that's it's what the, the word is, a mirror. I heard, a, um, <clears throat> I heard another pastor kind of give this illustration to uh, like, to point this out. And I thought it was really helpful. And so what he did was he said like, hey, you know, just imagine like, hey, you know, you're at home and your kids are playing and, you know, the bedroom, their, their room is, it's gross. It's disgusting, right? It's a typical kid bedroom, right? It's all messy. So you say, hey, I need you to go clean your room. So 20, 30 minutes pass and, you know, they go, they're in the living room, they're playing around, doing whatever. And you go, hey, did you, did you clean your room? And it's like, well, no, but I prayed about it. I prayed about cleaning my room. Like, okay, it's good. I'm glad you prayed. Like, that's, that's good. Like, we should do that. But did you clean your room? <laughs> well, no, but here's the thing. I had my friends come over, and we did a word study on the word clean. And we found out that in the Greek, clean means blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's like, okay, stop. That stuff's good. But did you clean your room? Like, you get it? It's, if there's no obedience then all of the religious activities are pointless. Right? That's what James is saying here. Religious acts that don't lead to obedience are worthless. James says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Again, I, I want to be clear. I'm not like anti-small group and Bible studies, right? Bible studies and small groups are amazing. They're great. We should do them. Like, you should be involved in them. They are great tools for your discipleship, for your spiritual growth, absolutely. But the point is that if, the, if those things don't actually cause you to become obedient and to submit your life to the Lord and to, you know, make choices and to actually live differently and treat your family differently and treat your coworkers and the world around you differently, then it's just religion. It's just religion and it's not actually discipleship, right? And James is saying that stuff is pointless. That's pointless, right? So, and I feel like when James is writing this, he's remembering what his brother, what Jesus said towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus wrote, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So in that passage there, Jesus, he's talking about how, you know, there will be one day, there will be the day of judgment, right? Where all of us are brought before the Lord and we will be judged and we will be held accountable. <clears throat> and Jesus is saying that, hey, on that day, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be really confused because they're going to be saying like, wait, Lord, I don't understand. Like, look at all of the things I did. For you. I prophesied in your name. Just I went on mission trips in your name. I did all of, all of these religious, you know, activities in your name. I'm, I don't understand. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Yeah, you did all of these things. Cool. But your heart was far from me. I never actually knew you. So depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I, mean, I want to say that, like, as a pastor, right, that, put, that passage puts the, literally the fear of God in me. But it's a healthy fear, right? Because it forces me to constantly examine my own heart and to tend to the garden, to see where are the weeds coming up? Where are the thorns? Like, where are the thorns? Again, I said at the beginning, it's progressive sanctification. It's not a one-time thing, right? So constantly, okay, what? So cool, got some weeds and thorns, ripped out great. Well, guess what? Now there's new weeds, and now there's new thorns. It's like, okay, I have to address those too, right, with confession, with repentance, right? It's a continual day-by-day -day thing. In that passage, right, um, where Jesus said, you know, hey, I, ne I never knew you, that should put a healthy fear in us, healthy fear, right, where, again, it mot motivates us to just constantly examine our own hearts,
And what's amazing is that as we do this, as we do that, something beautiful happens. We are transformed. We're transformed. And we are made unrecognizable. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 3.18, where he says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul says that we have an unveiled face. All right, this, is, uh, this is in reference to Moses. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, Moses, he, when he was face-to-face with the Lord, God's glory was, like, shown show, so brightly that it was actually reflecting off of Moses' face. And the Israelites couldn't look at him. They couldn't look at him. And so Moses wore a veil, right? Moses wore a veil. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so Paul is saying that, hey, now we all have an unveiled face, right? So the veil is off and the glory of the Lord, right, is reflecting and shining off of us to the world around us, right? And that is our calling and that is our response or responsibility. Just like how Moses had an encounter with God and was made unrecognizable, when we look into the mirror of the word with a heart that is ready to receive it and to act on it, the Holy Spirit uses that word to make us more like Jesus. And when that happens, we're not defined by the weeds and the thorns that we ripped up. We're not defined by our past or by our mistakes. Instead, we have the glory of God reflected upon us, and we are unrecognizable. I mentioned at the beginning, right, that we have three responsibilities when it comes to God's word, right? The first, receive the word. The second was live the word. Third, share the word. James ends this passage with verse 27. It says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Uh, See, this is key here. He highlights orphans and widows because at the time, orphans and widows were two of the most marginalized and just cast aside members of society. And James is writing and he's saying, hey, stop being so concerned with yourselves. Stop showing favoritism to the rich. Stop neglecting the poor. Stop competing for power amongst yourselves. Just stop all of those things. True religion is go to those people. Go to the outcast. Go to the marginalized and love them as Christ has loved them. Serve them as Christ has served you. Pure religion before God has nothing to do with how many mission trips that we've been on or how many verses we have memorized. Pure religion before God means taking the hope that we have received from God and sharing that hope with those in need. It means going to the lost and going to the broken and helping them with their physical needs, yes, but with their spiritual needs as well by telling them about the hope that you have in Christ, the hope that I have in Christ. Telling them about how we were lost and broken and dead in our sin with no hope and then at our lowest point in our weakness while we were dead in our sins, not after, not after we cleaned ourselves up and you know, made everything look good. No, when we were dead in our sins, that is when Christ came and died for us and died the death that he didn't deserve on our behalf. And his blood was the payment for our sins that we could never pay ourselves and his resurrection gives us victory and you can have it too. Just admit your brokenness, acknowledge your sin, repent of it and you will be made new. And that is true religion. That's true religion. Being transformed by the glory of God and allowing that transformation to impact every area of our lives and inviting others on the journey. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, I thank you for the truth of your word. God, I pray that you would help us, help me, help all of us, Lord, to be not only hearers of the word, but to be doers. Help us to be obedient to who you are and who you have called us to be and what you have called us to do. Thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. So we are going to take uh, communion together today. Um, so if you did not receive a communion cup, if you want to take communion, if you want to slip your hand up in the air. Got, oh, okay. Wow. There we go. I actually need one too. <laughs> so while those, while those cups are being passed out, um, <clears throat> while those cups are being passed out, let's just talk for a moment. What is communion, right? So this is something that we do as a church regularly, um, and we do it primarily because we've been commanded to do it in Scripture. Um, and this is something that we do to take and to honor. Oh, thank you. To reflect and to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we do that by taking the elements, the elements which are the bread and the cup. And now, <clears throat> there's nothing super magical about these, right? It's a piece of bread and it's some juice, right? But the beauty is in what they represent, right? The bread representing the body of Jesus that was broken for us and the cup representing his blood that was poured out on the cross on our behalf, signifying that there is Nothing but the blood that can make us right with God. Not our good deeds, not our church attendance. No, nothing. Only the blood of Jesus can make us right with God. So that's why we take communion. Um, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul also gives us a couple, some instruct, instructions on how we should take communion. The first is that this is for those of us who have already placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Right, so if you're here today and you have not yet made that decision, I'd ask that you, well, first, I just want to let you know we're so glad that you're here. And I pray that you continue to come, continue to come. All right, but I would ask that you don't participate in communion, and it, that you don't participate in communion with us, but you instead kind of just sit back and just observe this beautiful picture. Um, but if you're here today and you've decided that, hey, today is the day that you want to place your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time, then amen. <laughs> By all means, go ahead and take communion. And But please let us know that you made that decision. On the connection card, there's a spot where you can check the box saying that you trusted Jesus for the first time. <clears throat> and that's not just to like, again, not just to check a box. That's to let us know because, hey, as your church, we want to come alongside you. We want to celebrate that with you and also help kind of give you steps of how to begin this new life and this new journey. So make sure you let us know if you make that decision. The second instruction is that we're not to come to the table in an unworthy manner. So what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. Of course not. Um, what it means is we shouldn't take communion if we have unconfessed, unrepentant sin in our lives. So what I want to do is just give us just a few moments just quietly to yourselves <clears throat> between you and the Lord and just ask the Lord to search your heart. Ask him to search your heart and see if there's anything in there, any weeds and thorns that need to be removed before we take communion. So I'll give you uh, just a few moments to do that and then we will take communion together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take the cup. Father, we love you and thank you. We thank you. 
the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus broken and poured out on the cross for us. Jesus dying the death that he did not deserve, paying the payment that he did not owe, also that we could be made right with you, that we could have our sins forgiven, that we could be made new creations. And Lord, thank you that he did not stay dead, but that three days later rose again, rose again, giving us victory over sin and death and the world. Again, Father, I pray that you would help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.